When the modern mind looks back at the earliest Christian teachings, it senses a disconnect. It sees a distortion, a blurred view of the picture Christ painted. Over the centuries, each generation of Christian interpreted Jesus' lessons for their culture and their context, emphasizing some things over others, obscuring some teachings while amplifying some, leaving the following generations to ask, what is truth? and what is merely a trend. As we look upon this complex mosaic of beliefs, the presently urgent and historically inevitable question persists. What must I believe to follow Jesus? What are the unshakable truths that define our faith? And what are simply fashionable, new, or novel? The challenge is heightened by the proliferation of denominations, each asserting their perspective as the truth sometimes viewing others with skepticism or even disdain. This breeds confusion, urging us to seriously contemplate what are the major and minor principles of our faith? What are the non-negotiables that we can all agree upon? What do Christians really believe? Modern day culture teaches that truth begins with the individual, that each person is the source of their own truth. In this series, we courageously venture on a journey to recapture the essentials of Christianity. We aim to discern what must one truly believe to authentically follow Jesus. So this morning we're going to open up with a thought-provoking question. How many people are ready for that, right? Let me try to get, how many of you are ready for that? Ready. It, it, what, I, what I'm hoping is this would be a question, like when you're in the parking lot, um, talk about it. When you're with your family, talk about it or with your friends or whatever it would be. It's a question that I think is so profound. It's a different question. If you're new to New Life, prepare yourself um, because this is what we're all about. This is a question that's meant to make us feel a little bit uncomfortable. How many of you want to feel uncomfortable at church? Are you ready? Okay, here, here's the question. It's odd. I want to tell you it's odd, but I think it will help us have this conversation this morning. The question is, if you, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, let me pause there. Somehow, if you, not your neighbor, you can talk about your neighbor, that's more comfortable, I guess. But if you were put on trial for being a Christian, here's the question. Would you be convicted? Wow. Yes. Amen. Like, if you were, if like, if, forget, I know some of you, of course I would. No, no, think about it. If you were put on trial for being a follower of Jesus, is there enough evidence to say that you're guilty of being a follower of Jesus? And I guess if we did this, right, we would have to get out witnesses, right? Let's get out some witnesses. How about um, your coworkers that you work together? What would they say? Ooh. How about uh, like when you're getting your coffee at Starbucks and they're not serving you right, what would that person say? Or let's get personal. How about your kids? They'll tell the truth. Like what would your kid, like if your kids came up and they put on trial and they have to tell the whole truth, we all get that. But they like, like dad, mom, they really like, really love Jesus. Would you be convicted? I want you think, would you be convicted? And this is a kind of an odd question. It's probably not one to ask on your first date if you're like single dating. You probably should, but you shouldn't do it, right? Would you be convicted? Beyond a reasonable doubt that you, myself, I'm a follower of Jesus. Now, here's the other question behind this. On what grounds, like what evidence, what evidence would the court review? Like what evidence would the court review? And today we're going to look at Appendix A in a few moments and talk about the evidence, okay? Like really what evidence at the end of the day, and this is going to shock some of you when you think the real evidence, because if you thought about it, you know, oh, the real evidence is I'm sitting in church. Isn't that good enough? No. Isn't the real evidence that I give? Not really. All those good to give, right? What, like, what is the real, and I want to say Bible evidence that Jesus is the Lord of my life? What is that? 
And I want to tell you two things. If you're a new lifer, I want you to lean in because this is so critical when we answer this question. It's so critical. And if you're here and you're newer to new life or you're not a Christian or trying to check this out, I want you to lean in. Because I think when you find the real evidence of what all Christians should be like, man, I think it's actually something you should consider following, like give your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what evidence? So we're going to look at together. We're going to land today, land in a passage talking about where Jesus is um, one of the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. And we're going to see how Jesus answers the question with Matthew 22. So how many people are ready to jump into this question? You ready? Let's do it. So we're in this series, and we're talking about, like, what are the main things of Christianity? We have challenged every one of us, um, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I know that some people are throwing out all Christianity, and I say, don't lose baby Jesus. Yeah. Don't lose baby Jesus. And what we have done, instead of deconstructing the faith, because we live in a generation people are de- deconstructing, we should declutter it. Declutter it. Every one of us should declutter it. Because it's critical. Because if you start deconstructing it, you're going to ruin the whole thing. But I do think that as a church, that if we care about the next generation, we better figure out what are the main things of Christianity and what are the minor things. And not argue over the minor things, but keep the main thing the main thing. So this is what the series is doing. And I believe, by the way, this is more than a series. This is a a roadmap for our church as we raise our next babies, as we raise our children, as we raise the next generation. Lord, help us to help people not to throw out baby Jesus as we throw out the bathwater of so many things around us. So Jesus does a phenomenal job here. He, like, taught, he's, he's going to brace himself. He's going to declutter Christianity to the core. Yeah. He's going to say, you all think Christianity is about this? It's not. He's going, you all, you religious people, you think this is Christianity? He's going to shock the world. And this is what Jesus did. He shocked the world, what it truly means to be a follower of Jesus. So here's what's going on in Matthew 22. A Pharisee, and those of you who are newer to the Bible say Pharisees are religious people. And when you study the life of Jesus, religious people didn't like Jesus. Yeah. Remember, the people that really liked Jesus were the sinners. Where people that weren't like him, like him liked him. I mean, they, they, the people that were like opposite, but the religious people of the day, they just didn't like Jesus at all. So one of these religious guys, a Pharisee, comes up to Jesus and he backs Jesus in the corner. Let me pause here. When you're talking to Jesus, don't try to back him in the corner. Okay. Even if you don't believe he's God, he's better than you. Believe me, he's a profound teacher. And so this Pharisee, in his arrogance, backs Jesus in the corner. And this is one of the many reasons I love the Bible, because it's so rich with um, controversy and so rich with tension. And the Pharisee comes up to Jesus, says, he says this, teacher, so trying to pay him respect, but it's really sarcastic. You'd have to have some sarcastic music behind this. I'm not sure how you do that. But teacher, okay, okay, you've been teaching, you've been doing miracles. Okay, what is the greatest commandment in the entire Bible? Sounds like a child, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like something a five-year-old would ask? That's right, like, okay, Jesus, mom, dad, tell us what the greatest rule in the house is, and we'll do that, right? They're, they're trying to trick Jesus, and if this was a TV show, it would be a commercial would come on right now. Because you'd feel the tension, the tension of the audience, they're, they're taking the rabbi, Jesus, and the Pharisee is trying to back him in the corner and say, do you really believe all that stuff in the Old Testament? Do you really believe it? Because there was like 615 different commandments. Of all the commandments, what is the greatest? And Jesus does something so profound. He literally declutters Christianity. He brings it down and says, you all believe this and you all have all this clutter, clutter. Let me just give it to you what it is. And he says this. He says, he says Jesus replied, here it is. Love the Lord your God. Love God, the Lord your God, with all your, come on, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In other words, I want you just to love God. Amen. You are God created you on purpose and with a purpose. And I want you to take everything, everything you see in the Old Testament. I just want you to be fully devoted to the Lord your God. Amen. And he says to people, you know, and this, this, this is so huge right here. I want you to get this. This is the first, and not only the first, it's the greatest commandment. Like, 
if you like don't, not, he doesn't say don't worry about the rest, but in a moment he says the rest is just detail. I want you to get this. And if you don't get this, you'll miss everything. <laughs> Do you love God? And notice he's not talking about all the outward stuff of evidence of being a Christian, like all the outward stuff that we talk about, like how high do you raise your hands? Like, I don't know if I care. <laughs> or where do you sit at church? I'm not sure, right? He's going like this, no. Do you love God yeah. with everything inside? Not the outward show that we kind of demonstrate, right? The evidence is not the outward, but do you love God with everything inside of you? Yeah. You get that right? Everything else is going to be good. And everyone's watching going, okay, that was good, Jesus. The audience is watching, but he says, I'm not going to stop there. And he does something so profound here that it it needs to wake us up. It needs to make us uncomfortable. He said, and the second is like, and the Pharisee's going, hold on, you're not allowed to give a second. I am too. I'm Jesus. He's going, the second is so like it. I can't leave it out. Like it's so close to it. He says, second is like, and here's the second, love your neighbor as yourself. Like, like people, love people. Like, I want you to love people in the neighbor here. The Pharisees are funny. So who is my neighbor? Jesus, oh man, you are so silly. He didn't say silly. He just, I'm not sure what he said. He just said, you're, you're, you're not thinking. He says, you're acting like a child. He said, who's your neighbor? Let me tell you, your neighbor is anybody that you don't like, Right? Your neighbor is anybody that you go are a little bit different than you. They're, they're, they don't think like you. They don't act like you. Jesus said, here's all Christianity. This is so profound. I don't want you to miss the implication. The implication of this is so, so big. He's saying all Christianity, and by the way, all Christians believe this. We just don't live it. Yes. Right? All Christians believe it. We just don't live it. Is that we should love our neighbors. We love ourselves. Well, I mean, it's like profound. Matter of fact, Jesus said in another place, like you should pray for your enemies. Yeah. Oh, but most of us don't think we should pray for them. We should crucify them. We should like dishonor them. Jesus, I want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he says something that I do not, again, this is the essence of this whole series. He says, all the law, the entire, the, all the things you Jewish people learned and studied, all Genesis, Malik, all, everything, all the law, and the prophets hang on these two commandments, love God and love people. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, the evidence of being a Christian is not all the outward stuff, but is having a passion fully devoted to God and fully devoted to one another. Yeah. It, let me show it to you like in a graph form. It's like all this stuff that's critical as part of the narrative. He's going like this, ah, no, no, but if you don't get this right, all this will just come to religion. All that, you got to love God, love the Lord your God, and love people. Here, here's the way Jesus said it. He said, he says, by this, will everyone know that you're a follower of me? By this, here it is, like if you were in court, is there enough evidence to convict you? Here it is, Jesus, here it is. If you, I'm going to say it together. Like that's Christianity. And I've I said through the series, if you're here and you're trying to figure out Christianity, Don't reject it until you understand it. Once you understand it, if you want to reject it, that's cool. But don't reject it because of the way we presented it. This is Christianity that we would love God, passionately love God, and we would love one another. Let me let me frame it like this. One of my like dreams, a vision for new life as a church is that people would look at us as a community and they would say things like this. You know, those new lifers, they believe some radical things. Did you hear that those new lifers actually believe that Jesus is God? And they, act, those, they actually believe like Jesus like died and he rose again and he's alive. Yeah. Those new lifers believe radical things, but you know what? Wow, they're some of the finest loving people on the face of the earth. Yeah. Like they love like Jesus did. Like, I want my kids, I want my grandkids to look at at Papa and go, wow, Papa, like I want them to believe what I believe. That's obviously, but I want them to go, Papa really lives that out the way he treats me, Ma, and the way he treats the kids. That's Christianity. And so we're in this series and what we're trying to do is build out a theological framework 
that we can pass to the next generation that we truly can build a church community on. And we're walking through our confession. Come on, church, is that Jesus is Lord yeah. and that God raised him from the dead. Come on, can we, can we say that out loud? Come on. Jesus is Lord. That's our confession. He is the way. He is God. And we're going to do everything we, as a church to pass that on to the next generation. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That is our foundation. And we have this beautiful rebar called the Bible. That's a beautiful narrative of the word of God that we want to come alive. Then we have a creed that says God made it. All of us are made in the image of God, beautifully, wonderfully, fearfully made. But we broke it. We sinned, we rebelled against God, and we broke it, and that broke the heart of God. So God came to this earth, and Jesus fixes it. With his death, his resurrection, his second coming. As we talked about last week, one day he's going to come back and fix it all. Come on, right? Jesus, and the church shares it. But we have this confession and we have this creed, therefore what, for why? The why of this, so we can love God and people. In other words, let me say it like this, you don't have good theology just to have good theology. Good theology should treat us, should show us, should impact us and transform us. Where I come out of this and go, man, I just love God with everything I have and I love people. I love people as I love myself. I love people around me. That is Christianity. So what we're going to do in a few moments, we're all going to go to court. How many people are ready? Is there enough evidence to convict you? Is there enough evidence to say this person is a follower? And by the way, get ready. We're all coming to the altar today. Now, before I do that, I want to pause here. I want to pause because it's really critical pause. And, and talk about attention. There's a tension that if you've been in the church for any length of time, especially in today's culture, that we all feel. We all feel this tension when it comes to love. And the tension we feel, let me put words to it, like is the church about love or truth? Wow. Is the tension love versus truth? Come on, we all know that, right? Like I have people ask me all the time, Pastor, I don't know how to ask this. Yeah, I agree with that truth, but uh, how do I love this person that is a different, a different lifestyle than me. How do I love that person? Or, or my 15 year old is like this, how do I love? And what we have, I want you to watch this, we have a culture, and not even talking about culture, but churches that what I call their love, love, love churches. It's love, 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 and everyone's welcome. Love, love, love. Yeah. And then there's churches are truth, truth. Yeah. Like we're gonna take the rebar and stab you with it. Stir truth. Right, and there's this tension that we all feel, and I wanna help you resolve that tension right now. The problem is, is we have the word versus, or the word or, the right Bible church is this, love and truth. Amen. Paul would say we need to stop being like children, stop being like children and grow up and understand these are not separate, they are infused together. And is that messy? You better believe it's messy. And do we get it wrong at times when I say we as new life? Yeah, we get it wrong. But we are committed to being a Bible truth that's founded and fused together with truth and love that we would be Jesus to this world that was full of grace and truth. And so I came up with a quote I'm hoping that will become famous one day. I don't know if you can quote yourself. Can you do that? But here's, I'm going to try. Here's a quote we came up with this week. Is that love without truth is junk food. <laughs> Sugar high. Come on. All you have to do is open up Krispy Kremes and everyone comes. Uh-huh. It's just sugar high. It's, and there are a lot of pastors on a sugar high. You can build a congregation. It's really, you really don't build a congregation. You're building a bunch of fans, right? It's junk food, but you know, we all like, we get it. We, we want to go to, to get that blizzard. It's, it's just not, you can't eat on it, yeah. live on it. Yeah. But the opposite of this is true too, is that truth without love is rotten food. Yeah. It's spoiled food. Yeah. And you know what a lot of church has done? Churches, I'm just saying out there, we either have junk food or rotten food and we need to come back to the Jesus food. Yeah. We need to learn, as Paul said, this is so big, mom, dad, 
every one of us, we have to be committed to this. That seems like they're, they're opposite, but they're infused together. We have to be like Paul that said in the book of Ephesians, stop being like infants, stop being blown by every wind of doctrine, every wave that comes your way. He says, instead, I want you to learn how to speak the truth, how to speak the truth in In other words, speak the truth in love, not in judgment, but infuse with the passion of Jesus coming back to the greatest commandment out of love for God and love for people. Jesus was full of grace and truth. And new life, I'm telling you, I know it's messy and I know it's confusing and I know our cultures, everything's out of control right now. But we are committed to speak the truth in love. And I'm, 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 I'm pleading with you, if you have influence on anybody that's not a Christian or influence in our culture, our kids, that together we collectively go on this journey to say, here's our truth. Jesus is Lord. Yeah. The Bible's our rebar. We believe in the Bible. God made it. We broke it. And we say that with a broken heart. It's not you broke it, but we did. Jesus is the only answer. Yeah. And now together, collectively, We're going to love God and we're going to love people just like Jesus did. So the question is this, is there enough evidence? What evidence would the court review? And I want to suggest that the court review, at least for this dialogue, a passage in the Bible, let me suggest Appendix A, 1 Corinthians 13, where what Paul does here. We call it the love chapter in Christianity. And often we think about this chapter at a marriage time. This chapter has nothing to do with marriage. Really good for marriage, but nothing to do with it. It's Paul trying to say, this is the way we live out Christianity. This is what love is really about. Because I mean, you know, it's really easy to say, I love God and I love people. But what does that mean? Well, if you were in the court of law, here's what this would mean. Here, I'm going to show you exhibit A. Paul would say, okay, let's define it. And what he does here gives us such a definition. It's like you like trying to demonstrate, do we live that out? Paul would say, Appendix A, he would go, okay, let's talk about love is patient. Like some of us can't be patient getting out of the church parking lot, right? <laughs> love, Paul would go, okay, we're gonna love God, love people. Patient. That means we need to speak the truth and come on, say it. Patient, with patience. Some of you go, well, why should I be patient? I'm right. That's the problem. <laughs> that especially if you have, you're raising, I keep on thinking about the next generation, just my heart's so there. We're going to have to patiently bring them back to the gospel. Amen. Patient. Love is patient. Now, here's the deal. I'm glad Jesus is my lawyer right now because I'm, I'm like, wow, I might lose my patience. But Paul would say, no, no, no. And the lawyer would come up, okay, let's bring, the, let's bring the spouse, let's bring the co-workers. Is this person patient? Do they have the patience? Love is patient. And if you think that's bad, it gets worse here. How many people ready to get worse, right? Here's what it means to love God and love people. Love your neighbor. People you don't like, love not as long as patient. Love is like kind. Like we can be kind people as we present the gospel. And you actually have pastors out there and because I'm trying to be kind, I'm not gonna mention their names, come on, right? But they're not kind. It's like, what's, your heart's not broken. Yeah. You're like, be kind, just be like a human. Paul would say love is kind. So when I talk to someone that's in disagreement with me, I'm not gonna take the rebar and stab them. I'm gonna be kind and I'm gonna listen and I'm gonna present truth in love. Is everyone still with me? Come on, this is Appendix A. Like, are you guilty? Is there enough evidence? (laughs) And I'm telling you, you know, if you follow me for a week, I don't know because I'm not always kind. And my wife reminds me, you're like the pastor. You need to be kind. (laughs) Right? You're the pastor. You should be patient. I'm going, I know sometimes I hate being the pastor because people watch me. But is, is there enough evidence? Some of us, like, like your home, the temperature of your home, is it patient, kind? Oh, do, do you want your kids to see Jesus at your home? Yeah. It gets worse. How many people are ready, right? Love, is, love, is, love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. It's not proud. It's not full of yourself. There's a lot of Christians so full of arrogance. I'm going, 
wow, like you're right all the time and you probably are, but you're so right, you're wrong. Yeah, that's good. You're so right, you're wrong. You're so full of like arrogance. You know, you, let me just remind you, the Bible says a whole lot more about pride all the way through the scripture than all the other little things we like to pick on. If we're gonna reach another generation, we gotta let them be okay that they ask questions and not be so full of arrogance. We have to walk with the humility of Christ and pick up a towel instead of our title, I'm right, you're wrong. Love breaks for people. It's not just, I love God, I love people, okay, now I'm right, and everyone else, no, we have to speak the truth in love. Love does not dishonor others. Wow. Love doesn't dishonor people. And this is talking about people that we disagree with. Come on, I remember being in Bible college, training as a minister, and my professor looked at me and it impacted me. He said, to disagree with the honorable man is not to dishonor them. In other words, disagreement is not dishonor. And we gotta get comfortable with it. Some of us, man, if someone disagrees with me, I'm just gonna dishonor them and counsel them. Read the Bible, everybody. I don't even want to talk about politics when it comes to this. Everyone gets really quiet at that moment. We shouldn't dishonor. Yes, I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm going to do it in a way that honors people and respects people. And yet this is truth. There's a disagreement, but it doesn't mean I have to stab you with the rebar. Does everyone understand that? And yet we as a church, we get so lost. Truth versus love, truth versus love. It's truth and love. Love is not self-seeking. It's not like, look at me, I'm right, you're wrong. It's not self-seeking. Love, (laughs) get ready, is not easily angered. And some of you right now, you're just angered right now because I'm talking about this. Love is not easily, another truly love, I'm not ready to fly off the handle. So I'm ready, I'm not venting my feelings. How many people love the Bible? So you still like the Bible? Because this is, I'll just blame this is in the Bible. Okay, good. It's not like when Jesus said, love God and love people and love your neighbor and pray for your enemy. He says, don't get easily angered. And, and we all know our culture today, people get, they get so easily angered. It's like, wow. I want to say, what are you angry? Why are you so full of hatred? Like come to the altar. Like something's wrong is if you're talking about truth and it's, We can talk about truth that we believe in. God made it. We're wonderfully and fearfully made. I don't have to be full of anger and keeping records of that. And remember, I can look at this. Love keeps no records of wrongs. Some of us wouldn't even know how to live if we started to love like this. I meet people when it comes to records of wrong. Oh man, and they're just ready to tell you how, why everything's wrong and why everything's wrong by, by the way, the last church. And you said, no, my pastor, everything's wrong. Blah, 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 blah. Like, Whoa, yeah. you ought to take that record of wrongs and put it at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That record, like you ready, you're ready. By the way, this is really good marriage advice, everybody. You're so full of the wrongs and there's so many wrongs happening around us and I get that, but we can't keep a record of it or or nobody's gonna like you. Preach it, pastor, I'm trying, I'm trying. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It just doesn't. Love, Paul goes on and says, does not delight in evil, (laughs) but rejoices with the truth. Man, some of us are quickly, if someone falls, we just delight in it. If somebody has a bad day, we just delight in it. We would never say it like that, but privately we do. Paul says, no, 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 no. We need to rejoice with the truth. I love how he he says, love always protects. Come on, new life, let's protect our kids. Let's protect one another. Come on, love always trusts. Love always hopes. I love this world, it's always hopeful that the best is yet to come, love always perseveres. Love. Is there enough evidence to convict you that you're a Christian? And honestly, I look at this list, I'm going, whoa, the pastor needs to get saved. Why? It's so profound. But it's truly 
authentic Christianity lived out. All Christians like believe this. Every Christian, you, we all believe it. We just, we just don't live it. It's interesting. We, I come to a moment like this, people will go, can you have a good relationship with someone that you disagree with? And here's my response. It's called marriage, everybody. Yeah. Wake up. It's called relationship. It's called love. It's called being Jesus. What my wife needs me more than anything is to be Jesus to her, to be willing to die for her, to be willing to lay aside my own agenda. What my grandkids need and what this church needs and what our culture needs is not people that take the rebar and just start stabbing me with it, but we take the rebar of scripture and we carefully put it together and carefully form a foundation on the Lordship of Jesus Christ so we can save a generation from the evil all around us. But if it's not baked in anchor and love, all we will do is create a bunch of religious people without a relationship with God. And Paul says this, he says, hey, now these three things remain at the end of the day, faith, Hope and love, these things, like, there it is. He's decluttering Christianity. It's around these three things. And he goes one step further. He says, I'm not only gonna declutter it on this level. Let me go one first step further. And he says, and the greatest of these is love. He is quoting Jesus. This, says, this is the first and greatest commandment and the second like it is love. So what's our challenge? Our challenge is we live in a very messy confused, chaotic world. Let's be Christians in the middle of it. Let's speak the truth in love. Let's ask God. I realize some of you go, well, that's, that's a little bit confusing. It would actually be easier to say, follow these 600 rules. Wouldn't that be easier? Not really, but let's pretend. Jesus, no, no. Here it is. Love God. And love people. Let that be the governing force. Ask yourself the question, is this really loving God? Am I really showing, not, not, not because I want, you know, am I really showing people the love of Christ? Let that be the question that will govern all of our activity. Let that be the reason we have good theology. Because the next generation, I'm telling you, they're not going to accept junk food. And they're not going to accept spoiled and ruined food. I believe this next generation, they need the Jesus food. Amen. They need a great diet of Jesus. Come on, everybody, right? Yeah. And we have a responsibility. If you tend to be the junk person, like you want all sugar, or you the truth person, I'm asking for us to come together and be like Jesus that was full of grace and full of truth at the same time. So good. Let's pray together. Father, way easier to preach than live. I just say that out loud. It's just so easy to preach, so hard to live. So hard to live, in this, especially in the culture we're in. It's like a ticking time bomb all around us and people are ready to fly out the handle. People are ready to counsel each other. Then the church, we struggle with this. I pray supernaturally, every follower of Jesus would, um, we would repent. We come out of the weeds of this conversation and God, you help us to love you with everything we have and to love one another and to love people that we would speak the truth in love with a broken heart, with clarity and compassion at the same time. For the sake of the next generation, for the sake of the Pacific Northwest, let us be that kind of church. Let us be that kind of church. I want to take a moment here, and you may be here, or maybe you're online or one of our campuses, and you're not right with God. Perhaps you've never become a Christian, or you just drifted. You're a prodigal son or daughter. You need to come back home. At the end of the day, what New Life believes, we believe with all of our heart that Jesus is the only hope of the world. That Jesus, that we together as a community and individually need to confess Jesus as Lord. So I want to give you a moment here. We want to celebrate with you. 
if you're not right with God and you need to get right with God, perhaps the first time or you're returning home, I'd like you to stand right now and I want to include you in this final prayer. Come on, if you need to get right with God, I want you to stand. Boldly, without hesitation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's all stand together. Let's all stand together. Father, I just pray that together help us to build a framework of theology that we can build on, that we can pass to the next generation. God, together, even as we worship you right now, Holy Spirit, would you convict us Holy Spirit, would you show us how we can be more like Jesus to this world? More patient, kind, not self-seeking, not keeping records of wrong. Lord, I pray for all of us, we have a position of humility and repentance. Lord, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, I pray that we would be Jesus, the church to this world. God, we confess none of us have the answer to what's going on around us, but we believe that Jesus is the answer. So as we worship you, let this be a time of repentance, a time of worship, a time of honoring you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.